Aluminium-26, not a very active radionuclide, but with a fascinating story, especially when it comes to astronomy. Like our Thorium-230 and Calcium-41 and other standards, we manage these for our geologists. We cannot detect any measurable activity, but after some time we can record its gamma lines. What is on the agenda for today? Nuclear data and its gamma spectrum, aluminium as the first sign of radioactivity in outer space, aluminium and the dating of meteorites, and the stellar production of the the nuclide and the beginning of the solar system. Nuclear data. Aluminium-26 has a half-life of 717,000 years. It's a positron emitter and decays into magnesium-26. The emitted positrons have an average energy of 543 kiloelectron volts to a maximum of 2195 kiloelectron volts. The specific activity is 700 megabecquerels per gram. Two gamma lines can be assigned to its decay, one at 1808 kiloelectron volts and the other one, less present, 1129 kiloelectron volts. Of course, we can measure this one with the Geely, but we can also measure it with the radio code 103. The radio code could not measure any increased activity per se, but with a long term spectrum of 4 hours, we could detect everything we need to recognize. We can see the two gamma lines from the decay diagram here. Since the decay goes from a plus 5 state to a plus 2 state, which is quantum mechanically very forbidden, the aluminium-26 has a very long half-life. More on this in another video. Since it's a positron emitter and positrons are antiparticles, we have a rather large 511 kiloelectron volt peak, which is of course included in the spectrum. The gamma lines just mentioned were also the first signs of radioactivity that could be measured from interstellar space. The interesting thing here is that by the time the gamma satellite HeRO3 was able to measure these gamma lines, scientists had already noticed that they were finding an unusually high amount of aluminium-26 in meteorites. So let's take a short excurs into why aluminium-26 is present in those meteorites. Aluminium-26 is produced by spillation of silicon atoms. This usually occurs with very high energy protons. But there are enough of them in outer space. So meteorites. Meteorites are roughly divided into two classes. Astronomers, please don't hit me. They are the iron meteorites and the rock meteorites. There are of course many different types of rocks, but ultimately many of them are based on silicates. In other words, silicon in combination with oxygen. These silicate or rock meteorites can contain aluminium-26 through spallation reaction. When dating something, there are now various ways of measuring this aluminium-26 and different informations that can be obtained from it. One of these is the origin of the material. Meteorites that come from the outer solar system should contain less aluminium-26 due to their long distance from the sun, which is the source of the proton flux making the aluminium-26. It is also possible to date back when the meteorite fell on earth. Assuming that the aluminium-26 was in radioactive equilibrium after 7 million years during its journey, we only have decay and no kind of post-production from the time of the fall. In the case of meteorites, you can actually make use of the radioactive decay of aluminium-26 by means of coincidence measurements. If the 511 kiloelectron volt quanta hit the detector together with the 1800 keV quanta, this is a sign of aluminium-26 and not 511 kiloelectron volt from pair production of a gamma quantum of sufficient energy flying along from the background. Another possible way to measure aluminium-26 is against aluminium-27 with the AMS, or what is also popular with the GEOS, the isotopic composition of the magnesium isotopes using ICPMS. Let's see if our geologists are up for making a detailed video about this. More magnesium-26 means more aluminium-26 was present in the earlier period when the material was formed, and more aluminium-26 was present at the earlier times of the solar system, which was released by supernova, among other things. Aluminium-26 is often paired with beryllium-10 for dating purposes. Since beryllium-10 is formed by nuclear reactions on the oxygen and aluminium-26 on the silicon. So silicate materials are easy to date with this radionuclide pair. But we have one problem. The amount of aluminium in these meteorites is tens of orders of magnitude away from what the KRO3 measured. The satellite was also the start of X-ray and gamma astronomy. The satellite was able to measure 
1,800 kilo electron volt gamma activity, which was equivalent to the decay of three solar masses of pure aluminium 26 in the interstellar medium. Three suns of aluminium 26. What does the sun weigh? Ah, it's 1.9 times 10 to the power of 30 kilograms, with the specific activity of aluminium 26 being 7.09 times 10 to the power of 11 becquerels per kilogram, so 700 giga becquerels per kilogram times 2 times 10 to the power of 30 kilograms, 1.4 times 10 to the power of 33 gigabecquerels of aluminium 26. So it's terabecquerel, petabecquerel, exabecquerel, zeta, jota, rona, quetta, and then we run out of prefixes because these are orders of magnitudes that no longer make sense to clarify because, well, you can't imagine them at all. So we have way too much aluminium-26 in the universe for it to be explained by spallation reaction on silicon. Aluminium-26 is produced in galactic nova and supernova. Since the half-life of aluminium-26 is so much longer than the period in which nova occur in the Milky Way, the aluminium-26 should therefore be something that can be measured and this would then be the result of tens of nova that have taken place over the last hundred or thousands of years. This would correlate the 1800 kilo electron volt activity with stellar production. And that is true. Within the disk of the Milky Way, we have much more stellar production, thus more stellar nuclear synthesis, and thus more 1800 kilo electron volt gamma activity that we can measure, among other things, against the outside of the Milky Way plane. In stars, Aluminium-26 is produced not only at the very last moment of its death, but it can also be indirectly produced through fusion. Aluminium-26 is produced in various stars. So let's start from zero, i.e. protons. Protons and protons are burned to helium. This also happens in the core of our sun. And this is responsible for the majority of the sun's energy output. The PP process requires temperatures of around 4 million kelvins. Neutrons can be released in this process. And obviously in a region of the star where hydrogen is burned, we have many protons available. After a few million years, most of the hydrogen is used up. All the processes overlap very strongly in time and their dominance depends on the age, mass and type of the star. Helium is produced during proton burning. This helium can be converted into carbon, nitrogen and oxygen in secondary reactions. If you have these elements, which can still take place parallel to the proton burning in more massive stars, the CNO or beta Weizsäcker cycle can now take place. This is a mixed type of hydrogen burning that uses the products of this secondary reaction. Why is this a thing? Pure hydrogen burning takes ages, but once you have carbon, etc., these further elements in the second row of the periodic table, they can act as catalysts for further hydrogen burning. The disadvantage of a self-sustaining CNO cycle is that it needs around 15 million Kelvin to operate. This is the reason why the energy output of this cycle has only a small share in the energy output of our sun. The sun's core has about 15.4 million Kelvin, which means that the CNO cycle contributes to around single digit percentage when it comes to energy output. Now let's jump into the AGB stars. AGB is a phase in the life cycle of stars and when they have accumulated an extremely large amount of helium. Our sun can also do this within the last few millennia. Helium burning involves the triple alpha process, which produces carbon. At very high temperatures, carbon burning starts. In this carbon shell of massive stars, the process continues. Carbon-12 plus carbon-12 gives us magnesium-24. But helium-4, neon-20 and oxygen-16 can also be produced in this carbon shell. At the same time, reactions such as the carbon-12, carbon-12P, sodium-23 reaction produces additional protons. The latter is now quite important because protons are needed for the production of aluminium-26. And this carbon-12, carbon-12, sodium-23 reaction produces these exact very important protons in a region that is actually quite low in protons. A proton-rich medium is important for the production of aluminium-26. The aluminium is produced via P-gamma reactions, i.e. proton capture, of magnesium-25. 
The magnesium is mainly in the carbon to neon shell. It should be noted that it must also be a very neutron poor medium. If possible, free neutrons should not be present, otherwise they will turn aluminium 26 back into magnesium 26 via an NP reaction. Where do these conditions exist? Either in dying stars or the remnants such as the Wolf Rayet star. This so-called magnesium aluminium cycle ultimately looks something like this. At low temperatures the primary loss is the P gamma reaction to silicon 28. At high temperatures more proton captures takes place which can bred away from the aluminium 26. If a star dies aluminium 26 can of course also come from the last second part of the supernova but there is so much happening we will look into that in another time. The aluminium 26 is then thrown out into the outer space and can then be measured by probes such as the HeRO3. If your head is not spinning yet, not only meteorites as mentioned before can be dated via aluminium 26 but other silicate material. In this paper for example aluminium 26 was used in combination with beryllium 10 to trace the past of the Antarctic. Much smaller amounts of aluminium 26 are produced in Z2 by cosmic ray interaction on silicates. There is less than 10 to the power of 9 atoms per gram of material, so silicon dioxide material. For this you definitely need AMS. The radiation is no longer detectable. And what was the result? Noon attacks were investigated, isolated mountains or rocks that pierce through the glaciers and well because they are in the Antarctic they are often covered by ice and snow. But in a period between 750,000 and 3,570,000 years ago the ice cover of the larger Nunatak disappeared. It did so at a rate of slightly less than 1 mm per year. It was quite easy to see that there is a correlation between the height of the sample taken and the exposure of the material to the cosmic radiation. And for this someone from the University of Cologne went to Antarctica to collect some samples. Let's see what practical things we can recreate there, certainly not the Antarctica trip. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my patrons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.